Hello and welcome to the European Centre of Total Quality Management. The Centre has always had a tradition of uh, organising innovative products and initiatives to help industry absorb uh, new ideas and practices which are proven and which are based on world-class standards. We decided to launch an initiative by the name of Excellence 001 which is aimed at industries of all sizes and covering different sectors. The aim of Excellence 001 is really to um, convince senior managers that in the pursuit of excellence and raising competitive standards, they have to use an integrative, holistic, rigorous, continuous set of programs and initiatives to serve their uh, corporate strategies and to deliver value to their customers and stakeholders. The proposition that we're making therefore through this initiative is that excellence resides in the spirit of um, using all the drivers, all the capabilities at the disposal of any organization and particularly those that will deliver continuous and sustainable value to the customers and benefits to the organization. And the premise that we make through this series is that there are pillars of success that organizations need to focus on and pay attention to if they wish to become excellent. This session concerns itself with the transfer of knowledge and best practices within organizations. Indeed, the process of evaluating, disseminating, implementing, reviewing, routinizing ideas is extremely important is in a knowledge-based work environment. I hope you enjoy uh, this series that we put together for you and I hope that uh, you will manage uh, to absorb the principle itself and uh, to derive some uh, uh, ideas and benefits from these first-hand best practice experiences that we've compiled together and more importantly I hope that these ideas can serve the purpose of assisting you in putting together improvement action plans and hopefully in the pursuit of excellence in your organizations. Really this session again builds on what we've learned previously um, and I think uh, since we are now uh, in the era of knowledge management and uh, so knowledge becomes the commodity of doing business and knowledge becomes uh, really the, uh, the source of creating competitive advantage. Knowing a little bit more uh, about the tools, uh, the methodologies and the value and usefulness of the transfer of best practices um, is, uh, is something I'm sure you're interested in. Um, benchmarking has been a uh, uh, phenomenally important and exciting tool over the, the last 10 years or 12 years or so. Uh, the remark I would like to make is that as this growth was induced, many organizations became too absorbed with uh, managing benchmarking projects per se, rather than using it uh, as, um, if you like, an opportunity for creating knowledge and creating learning. So the primary purpose of benchmarking is, yes, to close a competitive, uh, competitive gap and uh, to deal with an issue uh, and a deficiency in business performance. But at the end of the day, what you retain is the knowledge because the knowledge becomes the capability that you propel yourself with and and, and move onward so please remember uh, from uh, as a first lesson from tonight that that is the real purpose of benchmarking it is to uh, create a new mindset a mindset of curiosity and a mindset for uh, inter interrogating if you like what we do on an everyday basis this is why it's useful to ask the question how mature our business organizations in the use of benchmarking and uh, if like for the purpose of transferring internal best practices. One survey, and there are several, but this one is a useful one to quote. One survey was um, uh, looking at knowledge management and the transfer of best practices. It was done jointly between the American Productivity and Quality Center and Arthur Anderson. And the survey concluded that only 15% 
of the organizations they have surveyed, and I think they looked at something like 55 uh, business organizations, only 15% of them know how to manage knowledge uh, strategically. They know how to build a competitive advantage with it. Because, as I said, the obsession is with a short-term requirement rather than the long-term. Uh, we introduce benchmarking because we have a cost disadvantage or, we, or because our lead times for delivering to the customer are too long or because we believe that uh, uh, we have a manpower issue, our numbers are too high. It's always that question, is the question of economics, of doing business rather than uh, uh, building knowledge uh, and building capability. What we would like to uh, suggest tonight is that the real benefit of using benchmarking is for acquiring best practices and is for encouraging the transfer of those best practices. Having said that, I think it would be foolish not to recognize that businesses are there to survive, businesses are there to close competitive gaps. So one is more important than the other, but one gets delivered by the other. If you introduce a process that will enable you to build and transfer best practices. Implicitly, you are already closing the competitive gap. Implicitly, you are already dealing with uh, deficiencies in performance, business performance. Why should you consider uh, the process of transferring best practices to be important? Because you compete on capability. You don't co compete on economics. You don't compete on this year's or next year's business performance. But your ability to continue to satisfy customer requirements and uh, maintain a lead over your competitors. And the other thing is, you compete uh, on a knowledge uh, capability basis. If you look at Microsoft, for example, its market value is much bigger than the top 11 giants in the world put together, added together. Microsoft is bigger than them. Sounds a little bit foolish. Those of you from uh, an accounting background will say, Mohammed, you've got it wrong. Um, it's because the intangible assets are worth a tremendous amount. Uh, and this is the way businesses are going to be, uh, if you like, uh, uh, measured and their capital or, uh, and, 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 and market value will be based on the residual knowledge, knowledge that they have. Uh, and that's the source of the competitive advantage because knowledge cannot be copied easily and cannot be duplicated. It has to be poached, stolen, or uh, you know you have to create from start. If you create it from start, you know it's going to be a big challenge because it takes time to create good knowledge. Knowledge and best practice transfer gives a lot of benefits. Again, the survey that was done by the American Productivity and Quality Center uh, has reported that organizations on average report a payback of something like $76 million in the first year of applying the concept of benchmarking. Uh, you know, basically uh, in line with their more successful benchmarking project. So we're talking about economics, we're talking about short, tangible benefits as well. There are, so, however, some issues, and maybe Trevor will touch on one or two of those, in the transfer of best practices. The common question is really, how do we know that this is a best practice and this is not a best practice? What is the process for evaluating uh, different best practices? And I'll come to that uh, in a few minutes. How do we know that these best practices that have worked so well for other business organizations are of relevance to us? And again, I'll come back to that. How can we transfer? What is the mechanism? Shall we automate? Shall we have a, a kind of IT system somewhere that will enable us to uh, build economies of scale and transfer best practices? How do we line up best practices with our corporate goals and objectives? How do we capture them in the first place? And how do you deal with a culture that resists new ideas, that rejects them entirely? And these are common issues and common themes that managers talk about. So let's go back now. Let's rewind the clock and really try to define what we mean by a best practice. Best practices are those practices that produce results. They are credible ideas, credible best practices. They are those that you select using systematic process. They are not due to bias, to your own impression. They are supported by facts and they are derived from a systematic process. They are judged 
in a consensus view as exemplary in the way they work and they can be substantiated with examples you can actually see seeing is believing that's why people like to visit they like to go to companies they go searching for best practices but because the principle of seeing is believing then uh, you know it's uh, it gives more credibility to that so best practices are then adapted to fit a particular organization they are not necessarily adopted they are adapted in other words you may have to fine tune refine and create a suitable environment for uh, ideas to uh, be accepted and to thrive within your organization. It could be jargon, it could be, uh, if you like, the complexity, it could be the approach, it could be a lot of things. Ideas can be manipulated. We don't have to take them as is. The one thing that you need to be wary of, um, and I've worked in a lot of industries, and managers say to me, Mohammed, wouldn't it be easier just to call them better practices rather than best practices? And, and I say, what's the difference? If you don't know better, better is best, isn't it? And um, I mean, I recall the motto from Unilever, which says, it's better to be good and first rather than being best and last. Because if you are good and first, you're the best. It's a moving target. Best is a moving target. What is best today may not be best tomorrow. So we must accept that. It's the pursuit, the continuous pursuit of learning and excellence. So whether they're called exemplary, best or good, uh, at the end of the day, um, it's the context, isn't it? It's the, the context is the industry, the context is the time, the context, the context is perhaps the relevance. And as far as uh, we are satisfied with that and as far as we can be satisfied that is fine you know because the time will move on and some of the ideas can be redundant in a matter of weeks rather than a matter of months so it's a commodity knowledge is a commodity let me take you through very quickly an example of best practice Chevron is one of the pioneers with uh, best practice transfer this is their definition, this is their description of what best practice means. It's any practice, knowledge, know-how, useful tips, experience, whatever it is, that can be proven to be valuable uh, and effective within a particular organization. And it could be something that is applicable in other industry contexts. So it could be specific or it could be generic. But it is something that is valuable. I mean, there's some key words there. And it could be effective. In other words, it creates an impact. It adds a new mileage. Uh, it gives you uh, a new perspective. And Chevron have different, uh, four different classifications of best practices. They have something called a good idea. A good idea is something that uh, somebody has brainstormed. So very often it is unproven. It hasn't been applied. It cannot be substantiated with data. But there is, uh, if you like, intuitively, uh, people might feel that yes we need those types of ideas and it could have positive impact on the business the thing is ideas are crude they're like raw data what we need to do then is move them downstream through a systematic process of evaluation of merit if you like weighing uh, of application and uh, then of review and then of routinization and I'll come to these steps in a minute so we need to start with the raw material we need to start with good ideas they have something called good practice the good practice are the things that evidently are seen at work technique methodology procedure process whatever it is but they are implemented and then the results can be seen to be effective and be supporting the organization of course here the credibility is no longer an issue because we can substantiate with data and we can see go to that particular location and you can see it at work and it could well be that there is external validation of that practice uh, by comparing what goes on internally with other organizations the third category is a local best practice Obviously, this is a practice that has demonstrated without any doubt that it works very well within a particular organizational setting. It has been verified upstream through uh, linking the processes and uh, the areas where it works. There's a lot of data to suggest how well it has impacted on the process and on the organization. And 
it could well be that there is an external validation by looking at similar ideas which have worked in different contexts and uh, different organizations. So there is an element of benchmarking them to c come at the conclusion that they are indeed some local best practices. The last category is industry best practice. These are the practices that have been pioneered externally. They are the local best practices in other uh, uh, industrial contexts. They are the ones that we can bring back. We can search for, grab and bring back. And they are again validated and supported and credibly checked for through data performance, uh, process analysis and everything else. So in total you see, uh, when we talk about best practice, we're talking about a generation of um, uh, evolutionary uh, principles. Uh, could be something out of the sky, something that, that is new and, and it hasn't been tested at all. It could be something local, which is seemingly uh, uh, doing uh, good things for the process or the organization. It could be a good practice which is institutionalized in a particular uh, industry or it could be an industry best practice which is generically applied credible and valid without the shadow uh, without any doubt at all so uh, let's not really, really look at best practice as one dimensional sources of information um, but let's start to think more in terms of this spectrum of ideas Trevor will have his, his own approach basically about how BT has uh, transferred and, and encouraged the very, very sister divisions to learn from each other. But this is a process which uh, uh, we suggest to you tonight on how you approach the evaluation of ideas and best practices and how do you go as far as embedding them into the organizational culture. Um, the steps are those that I will talk about, but one thing that will fuel, uh, encourage uh, a, a mindset of best practice um, acquisition, transfer and routinization are these enabling, uh, the enabling environment. And I'll say one or two things about that. First of all, searching. Searching is finding the best ideas wherever they are. Um, in other words, it's like uh, dealing with uh, financial institutions, you know. It's try trying to, um, uh, you know, put in your money where you think you're going to get uh, the best dividends. So best practices uh, become kind of an obsession. The, the, the thing that we have to be wary of is that um, uh, if you target one source for best practices, and particularly these are the best in class organizations, a lot of them are reluctant. To, to engage into benchmark initiatives because there is so much demand on them, uh, demand on them. and uh, if you want to access those organizations very often you have to join these consortia studies, um, some consultants led studies and whatever it is. Um, so let's not narrow the source, let's broaden the source, let's th you know, think laterally, uh, let's think outside the industry for example. Universities and libraries can be a very good source for giving you ideas and um, inducing you towards best practices. Reading journals, uh, articles, magazines and so on, books. Uh, access to best practice information on the internet. The internet is a wonderful, formidable source of information. Uh, there is a, a network called the Benchmarking Exchange, TBE. You can join for a small fee and you have access to a lot of information people networking and this network is good enough for you to uh, grab best practices and search for best practices and site visits I mean the DTI have got their own schemes the FQM has got its schemes you know and visiting because visiting is is very worthwhile because as I said earlier on seeing is believing so searching is not a problem you know you just need to know what you're looking for if you don't know what you're looking for, you can find anything that's in front of you. So we must really be precise about what is it that we want. And then we narrow the options. We can weigh the quality of the data, the quality of the information. And, and, and then, uh, uh, you know, build a strategy for moving afterwards. Evaluating is more tricky. Because you need to answer the question, how do I know that this idea is better than this one? 
and how do I know that this idea will work better for us? How do I know that the project initiative and the resources we have available will be supported by this particular idea? And you must make decisions. There is no simple answer to this. It's all contextual. And it's up to the situation, the particular circumstances, how desperate you are to move ahead with it. And there is an ideal scenario versus a practical scenario. So you must take a rough cut point. Because benchmarking is not a one-off journey. You're going to revisit, you're going to come back. So when you work for optimization, some of the things you couldn't do at the beginning are those that you can come back and complete. You know, so it's, it's uh, the principle of compromise is the principle of evaluation. Validation is very important because credibility, you need to build credibility, you need to convince the cynics, you need to sell those ideas to managers, you need to show them the benefits, you know, that this organization has saved, for example, 10 million pounds because they have collapsed three sets of activities into one, they have cut lead time by 40 percent, you know, they have used multi-skilling, they have automated the process, they have done a variety of things. So you must validate through performance. You, you must produce a kind of causality and relationships between applying those ideas and getting the benefits. We are looking for impact. We don't want change for the sake of change. Ideas are only a commodity. Good ideas are only those that give the results that you are aspiring to achieve. For example, because it's contextual, nobody can convince you that this is a good idea unless you want it to be a good idea. Texas Instruments they have a catalog of good ideas and according to them they said their 530 top best practices uh, are not validated. I don't know why they picked 530, please don't ask me the question. But they're leaving it to the teams who have, uh, uh, if you like, a challenge to decide on what are the best ideas that will work for them. Those 530 ideas have been reported to produce tremendous results for other organizations in different contexts but they haven't been validated internally until the need materialized so maybe maybe this is a good way uh, to consider the validation of best practices AMP for example have a, a rigorous process for validating uh, uh, best practices they have seven guidelines assessment feedback uh, measure you know, and uh, uh, feedback the improvements um, and all of this rigorous process basically will determine whether the idea has worked or has not worked. And obviously the ultimate is the improvement that those ideas will produce. So maybe, uh, you know, it's to, to put the idea to the test, maybe it's to do a pilot, maybe it's to review it before you standardize it and before you start to transfer it across the board. Um, smart way, I highly recommend it myself, you know, um, rather than uh, go for a full-blown uh, principle where you try to institutionalize improving ideas on a large scale, maybe this is a good smart methodology. Pilot, first of all, in a local kind of fashion, get the feedback, feel the temperature, fine-tune, refine, and then once you are sure that this idea produces results, then you have no fear because the credibility has been established. Then you can scale it up on an organizational-wide basis. So it's risk minimization and creating, if you like, high uh, chances of uh, large economies of scale. The phase four is implementing. Uh, the process of adapting and adapting uh, basically uh, has to be linked to rigorous project management and focusing particularly on the process. The idea is taken out of individuals and taken out of, uh, if you like, documents and embedded into the process. So it's enabling the process and transferring the best practice. Let's examine each one of those two words separately. What do we mean by enabling the best practices? It's by making the climate receptive to the idea, by making the process owners buy in, by ensuring that the sharing of those ideas is going to take place. So, what will facilitate the enabling process? Like everything else, visible leadership, management are encouraging, 
they are uh, educating, they are pe making people aware of the benefits of uh, the best practices. Looking at the inhibiting factors that will stop ideas from being accepted or transferred across the board. Looking at, if you like, cultural bar barriers, looking at organizational structure impediments, looking at mentalities and people's fear and, and stuff like that. And appreciating the degree to which the improvement uh, uh, is dependent on. Uh, people, process, technology, issues that help to direct the resources. So if it is people, it's awareness and training. If it is a process, you make sure that the, the steps of the process have been documented uh, and then there is compatibility, uh, if you like, at all stages. If it is technology, uh, basically if, it, if you're going to automate, you need to see whether the setup of the system or the technology can actually uh, embed the best practice within it. And, and those issues uh, are critically important and very often this is where you get a lot of failures in the uh, transfer of best practices. The transfer itself is really the learning from the best practices and the, the new climate that we create for that learning to prepare itself. As uh, Carla Odell says, the transfer is the most complex aspect of managing process which without expert facilitators and change agents to support it is very difficult to realize. This is f for the reason that having sorted out the hardware, the process, the IT, the technology and everything else, you are now left with the people issues. And what you want to do is convince people to abandon the old and subscribe to the new. You are actually tackling the cultural aspect of best practice adoption you know, at the forefront uh, and, and you must be prepared for that. Because people don't want to abandon the old, they don't want to let go of the old habits. So, the success in transferring best practices is reducing all of these impediments and the inhibitors and let, let me go through very quickly a list of those impediments. If top management don't really feel passionate about good ideas and best practices and they sell the, those ideas to people, people will, will, will carry on uh, basically you know, with business as usual or another scheme or yet another idea. What do they expect us to do with this? Well, it's not relevant to me. You know, I don't believe it's going to work here. You know? So those kind of reactions, and they are quite natural reactions. People, the first reaction is refusal, denial, uh, bias, cynicism. You know, it happens all the time. So what you need is, you know, people who can sell the new idea. They can put it into the context. They can elaborate. They can actually, uh, you know, uh, go through the credibility process. Now, if you don't have a precursor to a, a best practice to be adopted, then it may be difficult. So if you don't have a problem, for example, and very often people switch on to benchmarking when they have a problem. You know, oh, we're in crisis. Our top management team, you know, want us to go and benchmark and see what we can do. 90% of the time, this is how it happens. Or there is an opportunity. Oh, we've, um, we are amalgamated with a sister division. Um, and uh, we need to benchmark to find out how we can merge the two cultures together. How we can start to work together. It's a need. If, there is that, if that need is not there, people become complacent again. You know, they, uh, they, get, they go back to the old comfort zone. Uh, and they try to preserve themselves by, uh, you know, the, 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 uh, the application of not ro rocking the boat or something like that. Little shared understanding of best practices. And again, because the emphasis is on the routine and the emphasis has, is never on uh, challenging status quo, uh, thinking outside the box, uh, being innovative because innovation does not get rewarded. Most pay-related schemes are about not rocking the boat and producing uh, the results that b the business organization wants. This is actually taking you outside, uh, if you like, that highway system and it may create some discomfort within the business. So you need to deal with that if you want ideas to flourish and flow in the system. If you don't have a system for standardizing best practices, capturing them, evaluating them, 
piloting them, uh, adopting them, adapting them, <laughs> routinizing them. Why should the organization become different? Every organization in the world is a creative organization. However, most organizations have what we call tacit knowledge, not explicit knowledge. And the difference is that tacit knowledge resides with individuals. It's all here. I read the book, I've been on a course, I was sent on a conference. You know, I know that process because of my previous job, but it's all here. Explicit knowledge is more the system. Take it out of people's brains, put it on the internet, put it on public folders, and get people basically to apply it. Sounds simple, but it doesn't happen. So we must create a standard process for encouraging people to volunteer their ideas. You know, to write them down, to share them, to make them available. And then we will stand a chance of becoming a learning organization. So a creative organization is not necessarily a learning organization. And let's not confuse the two. Organization structures that promote silo thinking are organizations that are the enemies of best practice transfer. Because they are the ones who want to uh, create, uh, if you like, uh, uh, a sub-optimization and creating, if you like, the Damanas culture. A culture which looks at personal technical expertise rather than organizational capability or team-based expertise is looking for trouble as well. If you have, uh, if you like, lack of information exchange, as I was saying, and lack of contact between people, you cannot expect uh, the adoption of best practice to flourish. And again, if, you, if the reliance is on what's written rather than what's in people's minds, then, you know, we have a long way to go. Lack of time, people haven't got time to think, but they've got time to work. Now, think about that. Employees and managers not being accustomed to seeking or sharing knowledge. Yes, sounds surprising, but it is true. We must take adults and reconsider them as children and teach them again how to, uh, you know, latch on to simple ideas, how to use them, how to review them. You know, because, uh, you know, the, the, the mind can be routinized. And if it is routinized, we need to knock it and, you know, basically service it and get rid of the rest and people not being able to know what knowledge they have it's true you know if you don't really assess the knowledge that people have how do you know what your market value is the review is really making sure that the benefits start to materialize. We haven't stopped the transfer of best practices because we have disseminated it amongst all the sections or divisions or we have put uh, everything on lotus notes. The transfer has to be reviewed from the point of view of application, a review, and optimization and the benefits being materialized. And we must measure. We measure beforehand we measure when we start to apply the best practices because the end result that we want is a closure in the competitive gap. We are producing results. That's really what matters to us. Good ideas are ideas that work. Best practices, remember, are credible uh, ideas and ideas that de deliver results. I like this word, routinization, because it's really embedding the best practice uh, to become part of the culture. It's the ultimate goal for complete and effective transfers. You know, the way we do business around here. Has any of you heard the story of the hundred monkeys before? Yeah. Have you, Trevor? I've heard of the infinite number of monkeys. Right. Let me tell you the story, um, because I'm finished now. So I'll tell you the story of the hundred monkeys, and I'll, I'll give it to Trevor. This is a story of a hundred monkeys who got stranded in, a, in an island. And there was no food, nothing, you see. So they were all big monkeys, very hungry monkeys. The first one came across a potato. And he said, ah, potato. So he took a bite and he didn't like it. It was raw and, you know, chewy and, but it filled him, you know. So he said to the second monkey, guess what? He says, potato, he says, if you want to feel full and not hungry anymore, you know, this is what you do with it. You just bite it and, and uh, you'll be okay. The second monkey was a little bit more clever. So he took the first bite and he says, I don't like it, but if I take the skin off, 
you know, maybe it will taste better. And he ate it and he was happy. So he said to the third monkey, this is potato, you see, but make sure you take the skin off before you eat it and you'll feel happy. The third monkey was even more clever. So he took the bite and he says, no, maybe if I, uh, you know, put it on charcoal, um, you know, and bake it, it will be better. So he did that and of course he enjoyed it and he told the fourth, the fifth. When the story got to the hundred monkeys, he said, uh, uh, this is the way you eat potato, isn't it? So, uh, I don't know whether you got it. So, best practices start with... Uh, best practices start with, with, with uh, a lot of pain, a lot of uh, uh, inquiry. The mind is really trying to uh, adopt and adapt and, and make it suitable and beneficial. What, we know that the best practice has worked for the culture when the average person in the organization says that's the way we do business around here. So that's the way we eat potatoes. And on this note, I would like to introduce... I hope you have enjoyed this session. And indeed, I hope you have managed to derive some key lessons and perhaps some prompts from the conceptual side of uh, adopting excellence and from the application that uh, you have just uh, witnessed. Thank you.